Today is week three of our very short mini series on the Psalms. Okay, so three weeks ago, I took you through um, an introduction on the Psalms, and, and we and we we saw what it means for the Psalms to teach us how to praise God. Right. So we looked at praise Psalms, and then the week after, we looked at the what feels like the opposite, but it's actually just a part two of praise Psalms, which is the lament Psalms. And with the praise and the lament Psalms, we realized and we learned that the Lord encourages us. He doesn't just allow us. He encourages us to access the full range of our human emotions. And He not just accepts it, He desires for us to be honest. He desires for us to be raw and open and, and transparent and true before Him to how we feel. And in that space, we can be utterly, completely joyful so you don't have to feel like you have to gag yourself. You know, sometimes in this world, we feel that we can't really always be fully exuberant about our love for God because people will look at us funny, right? With the Lord, when we stand before Him, we can be exuberant about our praises before Him. And it's not just that. When we are before the Lord, He, can, he shows us, not this like, it's okay, we can just... Um, uh, take in fact we can take the screen off right for a moment yeah um before the lord we can also be raw and wounded and, and and cry and lament and weep and grieve before him and he's okay more than okay he desires for us to be true and honest with how we are and how we feel when we come into his presence and so you may think okay i suppose they have covered um that range of super happy and praising and then on one end and super uh, 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 grieving and lamenting on the other end. And is that it? Have we covered everything about Psalms? And today I want to take you into one more dimension of the Psalms, which is the dimension of love and affection and devotion. And so today we are going to be looking at the devotion Psalms, right? The devotion Psalms. And I will share with you two points, just two points, two simple points uh, that we are going to learn from the devotion Psalms. And the first one is this, that the Psalms give us an expression for our devotion, love, and fidelity. And the second one is that the Psalms give us an expression for our confidence and faith and assurance in God. But before we get into this, Maybe I just want to run a quick, uh, uh, um, I just want to profile us here, okay? How many of you, how many of you, okay, actually it's not how many of you, right? What is your favorite, now, now I want you to shout it out, physically I want you to shout it out, okay? Online, I want you to type it into the Zoom chat, okay? So just type it into the chat, okay? Can you tell me your favorite love song? Whoa, whoa. And I know some of you are like, wow, I haven't thought about I haven't thought about this. I'm not ready for this, right? What is your favorite love song? I'm not talking about uh, 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 church songs, okay? I'm talking about stuff you grew up in as, as a teenager. You listened to it on the radio. You were all set. You hit the record button on the cassette uh, uh, player, you know, and when it came on the radio. Or you bought, you bought the LP and you spun it at home, you know, as a teenager, right? I see some of us going like, yes, LPs, right? What's your favorite love song? Online, can you tell us your favorite love song? I, I, Unchained Melody. Oh my love, my darling, I've hungered for your touch, right? Um, wow, wow, thanks so much, Sherry. That's a good, that's a good favorite love song. I will always, I'm not gonna try hitting that note, right? Whitney Houston has notes that no human can hit, but, but yeah, wow, Jeremy, I will always love you. Come on, in the house, come on, let's hear some of your favorite. How, how deep is your love, how deep, right? We've got Bee Gees here, okay, what else? What else? What's that? Backstreet Boys? Which Backstreet Boys song? My Heart Will Go On? Wow, that's a love song of Titanic proportions, right? right? Wow, we've got some serious contenders for everybody's favorite 
love song taylor swift love story right come on baby just say yes right right okay i love you because and then we've got we've got wow there's a jay chow song i'm not gonna attempt this because i don't have the opinion here to guide me i'm gonna make a mockery of myself right uh, but it's we all we all we all love love songs, right? Or, or, or maybe if you are a little bit sick and twisted, no. If you are a little bit heartbroken, you don't just love a love song. You love a sad love song, right? It's another sad love song, right? Um, now we all love love songs. Why? Because when you are in love, when you are in love, there is something about being in love that that causes you to need to express that love beyond the language of the everyday. We know this. We actually know it deep inside our hearts. We know that there has to be some way to express affection that goes beyond just being able to just say or, or do things for people or, or, or something like that. And that is why one of the ways we turn to to express love for one another is through songs and actually it's not just songs right we express love for beautiful things we express uh, uh, um, um, love and affection for 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 the for the mysterious is that is there not something mysterious about love something you just cannot touch but you just feel it right and we we, we turn to these things through uh, um, through also think through the arts maybe right maybe we, we turn to these to, to express these things through the arts but I, I was just, I've been thinking about this. I've, it's not just in preparation for this sermon. I've been thinking about these things for a long time. That somehow, sometimes, maybe in our modern world, and maybe given the world we live in, the families we grew up in, you know, and the cultures we are exposed to, we may mean sometimes we neglect the language of beauty, the language of devotion and affection, we neglect it and we relegate it to some kind of little corner um, for, uh, and we label it, oh, these are for all the frivolous things, you know? And maybe it's our Asian roots that taught us to be pragmatic, right? Must, must, must be able to earn money. If it doesn't earn money, it's not worth doing, right? Uh, maybe our Asian roots taught us to be pragmatic. And maybe our exposure um, to, to Western culture taught us to be rational, right? And, 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 or maybe if you are from a, a, from a Western background, then maybe it's the other way around. Your Western roots taught you to be rational and your, your, and your exposure to Asian uh, uh, culture taught you to be pragmatic, right? But somehow or rather, we feel, or at least many of us, right? Many of us may, may, may be exposed to this idea that the expression of, of, of love and beauty and joy and devotion and, and, and all these things through music or for that matter through poetry, for that matter through art, for that matter through dance, for that matter through all these things that we call the arts, it's like this, yeah, this frivolous thing, you know, like, yeah, why, no need to do one, you know, cannot earn money one, you have no future doing this, you know. The, so we relegate it to some place that we just ignore. It's just something to do for fun in your free time. Now, now I don't want to take for granted the fact that for most of us, our grandparents uh, uh, live through times of uh, where putting food on the table was the most important thing. Right, and because uh, um, you all know about the Maslow uh, hierarchy of needs, right? When your basic needs to survive and to stay alive have not been met, okay, then your that, that, then your emotional kind of like arts driven needs to ha 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 staying alive, right, is not gonna get met because you just need to actually put food on the table. I get that, right? But today, maybe many of us are schooled and we've been learned, we, we've been trained in that kind of world and culture such that when we go to our actual bibles when we go to our actual bibles we may not immediately know how to enter into the world of language of love and then sometimes we go to the bible with our pragmatic worldview and with our rational thinking and we go to the bible and this is what we do we say i'm here not for all these frivolous love love things okay i want to i want to learn principles on how to succeed in life i come to the bible so that i can draw facts i can learn things right and i want to i want to um uh um be 
It's got to be functional. Your Bible must, I must be able to apply my Bible. And all of that will on some days be absolutely true. And you will see that across the length and breadth of a year's worth of pulpit teaching, cell group facilitating, and your own Bible reading, that you will see that there are many days when you will encounter biblical principles on how to live a good life. You will encounter um, very true uh, uh, application uh, learning points because God wants to train you and conform you to his image. But there are also many parts of the Bible that will stir you into an expression of love that maybe our culture has um, not really equipped us well enough to be able to deep dive into it and so today, we want to do something that might feel a little strange, work muscles that maybe have never been worked for a long time. You know, since you were a teenager being smitten and in love, you know, uh, um, singing Unchained Melody, you know. Um, and, and, and we are here today to access that language of love. And on that note, we go into um, um, our sounds. Right, we go into the Psalms. And so I want to show you two points today. Let's just recap the two points. The first one is that the Psalms give us language for expressing our devotion, our love, and our fidelity. Okay? And then the Psalms also give us language to express our confidence and faith and assurance in God. And these two kind of groups that are sitting really side by side in all our Psalms, you know, are the devotion Psalms and the confidence Psalms. And, and these Psalms are actually, they make up uh, the bulk of the most memorable Psalms in the entire pantheon. Psalm 23 is a classic confidence Psalm. Right? Because I will trust in the Lord. I know He is with me. Why? His rod and staff comfort me. Right? Psalm 91 is a classic confidence psalm. Right? Wow. Because I, I, I dwell under the shelter of the Most High. Right? Uh, um, um, he will be with me. Psalm 63, which we will look at. Right? It's a classic devotion psalm. My, my, my soul, my soul faith for you. My flesh, my flesh thirsts for you. Right? And that's classic examples of devotional Confidence Psalms. So let's look at Psalm 63. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water, you see how many ways, how many ways just in one verse of this psalm that this author, this psalmist, has found ways to say, I love you. And maybe for us, Malaysians or, or, or modern day people school on the pop songs of our generation or, or whatever. We how how many ways do we know how to say I love you? If I challenge you to write a love letter, okay, a letter to your lover, right? Your your spouse, your mom, your dad, whatever, how many ways would you be able to conjure to say I love you? I love you, right? Sometimes we just resort to the most succinct and economical way to say I love you, which often is, I love you, right? And we embellish it sometimes. We say, I really love you. And then sometimes we really have to embellish it and further. So we say, I love you so much. And that's about the extent that our vocabulary can take us. But take a look at this guy, right? Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. And then the metaphor, like, a dry, like in a dry and weary land without water, can you feel how much he longs for God? Maybe our pop songs um, have betrayed us and not done enough to teach us how to multiply the words of love. But then I realized that maybe our pop songs have not uh, betrayed us because on top of I love you, we can say, never going to give you up. <laughs> and never gonna, never gonna take, take you down, right? Let you down. Never gonna run around and desert you. Never gonna, what, what, what else is that? Right? Never gonna make you cry. Never gonna say goodbye. Never gonna tell a lie and desert you. Well, we're, okay, we're not doing not too bad, right? We're doing not too bad. We've got quite a lot of different ways to say I love you. But maybe for the most part, our pop songs, our pop songs have betrayed us and not taught us well enough how to multiply the words of language because I'll tell you one thing and this is a deep conviction I have I'll show you a quote just a, a, a few minutes later your ability and your vocabulary how rich it is 
how broad it is, how big it is to express something tells you how important that something is to you. We all know that the Eskimos seem appear, apparently have like hundreds of words for snow, right? But what do we know about words for snow? We live here in M Malaysia. We've got one word for snow. It's snow, right? But you know what? Honestly, let's reverse that, okay? Um, if you live in the West, you've got one word for tofu. It is tofu, right? But, we, but if you live here, okay, and then you have to embellish the word tofu, like fried tofu or, or, no, or bean curd, right? You may say bean curd, but that's the, Engli the anglicized version of tofu. And then you have to embellish it. You have to say like braised bean curd or this bean curd or fried bean curd, but smelly bean curd, right? But we live here in Malaysia. We've got many words for tofu, right? Or we've got many words for bean curd, right? We have tau kwa, we have tau ki, we have tau, 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 tau chu, right? We have tau ju, which is a small salty one that you put in mee siam, right? We have tau pok, right? Uh, we have, what, what, what are the taos we have? We have so many words to accept. Why? Because bean curd is super important to our lives, right? It's really important, right? It, it's the same way. The uh, Malay people, uh, we, we say rice. We got rice, rice in the field, rice on your plate, right? Uh, um, uh, rice in the sack. It's all rice, right? But, but if, you, uh, if you speak Malay, uh, BM, you've got padi, you've got beras, you've got nasi, right? And so, why? Because rice is super important to Malay culture, right? And so, the amount of words you have, how rich uh, your language is to express something, it, it, in a way, it does tell you how important that something is for, for you. And so, my friends, today I want us to uh, stretch our minds, stretch our, and, be, and desire to grow our vocabulary for the language of love for God. Because you know what, if all you can say to God to tell Him that you love Him from the day you, you, you became a Christian until the day you die is, I love you, I, I really love you, I love you so much, I'm never going to give you up, okay? Um, uh, if that's all you have, it's not enough. But you know what, I know maybe you're saying that, hey, uh, Pastor, I'm not the language language kind. I'm not the literary kind. I'm not like Pulitzer winning writer, you know. Um, so, so don't expect me that I'm a very square one, Pastor. I'm very square. I don't have all these words. That's why you have your Psalms. So you don't have to conjure all these words. You don't have to find them in a repository that doesn't exist. If you don't have those words, go to your Psalms. The words are all there for you. Hence, Psalm 63, and so many other Psalms like 63. And with that, let us continue. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding, let's just say looking, beholding your power, your glory. By the way, a lot of the devotion and confidence Psalms have a moment where he sees God and everything changes. Okay, and you'll see this in Psalm 73 as well. There is a moment in the way he says that, oh, I'm so dry, I'm so beaten up, I'm so all these things. And then I saw you. I saw you in the sanctuary. And then everything changed. Okay, and you'll see this quite a lot. Online, come to physical, you know, because in this place, you are like, I believe you can see God at home as well, right? But, but wow, wow, there's something powerful and it shifts our eyes. But let me, let me continue. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. Well, just hear the language of that. Because, and by the way, this word steadfast love, the Jewish word, the Hebrew word is, I'm going to say it as correctly as I can, chesed. Chesed, right? Okay, chesed, C-H-E-S-E-D, or H-E-S-E-D, but the H is, spelled, is pronounced with a k sound, right? The word chesed is so deep, so rich, so it's got so many layers to it that the English translators, and you can look at this across, right? Um, ESV, which is the translation you're looking at now on screen, says steadfast love. But some others will say everlasting love. And some others will, 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 will say forever love. And, and, and your, your covenantal love. Your, and we'll all try to find different ways of saying it. And it's not a bad thing. But it's there to show you that there's, there's, it's just one of those words that just doesn't have an equivalent. And so sometimes we think that every Hebrew word has an equivalent in English or every Greek word has an equivalent in English. That's not true. And then when we jump into the language of love, 
and devotion and affection in the Psalms, you realize that sometimes there is no word for it. And so sometimes when I look at steadfast love, I just say, because your hasad is better than life, right? And I understand. In fact, the word hasad is so layered in its meaning that it also includes a love that, it, that violates normal love. Just, just catch that. A love that is so extreme, it violates the boundaries of normal love. To the extent that hasad is translated, uh, uh, um, is used, for two areas in on two occasions in the old testament for for um what is what we would consider a very inappropriate kind of love uh, uh, um, um and so and so it's it just goes to show words have rich deep meanings and it's important for us to grow our our range to be able to express our love for god let's move on in psalm 63 so i will bless you as long as i live in your name i will lift up my hands and verse 5 i love this part right because the psalmist is doing something he's doing something so uh, um he, he at start he compared his love for god to the dryness he feels right my, my my tongue is dry my flesh faints for you and then now he says my soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food now, this is, doesn't come off poetically in English. And if you were with us three weeks ago, I, I showed you how difficult it is to translate from BM into English poetry and how you're, sometimes the translated outcome is just not poetic sounding at all. I think this is one of those cases, right? Because there's no way you can say fat and rich food in a poem and make it sound poetic, right? It's just, it's just but you want to know what he's really trying to say? Now, wives... Have, have you ever looked at your husband when he's eating his favorite food and then he just closes his eyes and then he just savors that food and then he has this look of ecstasy on his face that should be reserved for you and then you look at him and you tell him, honey, that face is illegal when it comes to food, okay? You're not allowed to have that face when it comes to food. Has that ever happened to you before? And you say that, no, that's, that's, your, that's your, the look for your love for me, not your love for, you know, fried chicken or something like that, right? And, and that's that face that your husband has, you know, is the look of what it means to love something so much that it's like worship. It's to the point of like, wow, wow, mengelio, right? And then the psalmist takes that. He takes that and he says, my soul will be satisfied in you like that, as with that kind of, of gastronomic ecstasy, right? It's like, wow. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. You see what he's doing is that, is that he gives you the picture of someone enjoying food so much. And then he says, my mouth will praise you. Because sometimes when you eat something so delicious, your mouth just praises, like so good. And then you like make all these like noises with your saliva that, that nobody should ever hear right in public. <laughs> and then he says here, my mouth will praise you. And so he's elevating that, that expression of love. And then he says, he gives you one more picture. So you get the dryness, you get the food, and then he gives you one more picture. I meditate on you in the watches of the night. I remember you upon my bed. And that's another way, one more way to tell you how much I love you is that I lie awake and I can't sleep because all I can do is think of you. And all I can do is remember the last two lines in your letter to me because those last two lines involves, includes the words, love you, sign your name, right? And how many of you in the days when you used to receive love letters from your, from your sweetheart, right? And you would look and read those letters over and over and over and over again, especially the part where they say, I love you, I miss you, something like that. And then, wow, your heart just melts when you see those words again and you literally... Remember those words as you lie upon your bed and you meditate on it in the watches of the night. You did. I know you did, right? I do too. And this, this is what it means, right? For you have been my help in the shadow. One more, one more different picture. You have been my help in the shadow of your wings. I sing for joy. And then my favorite line in this whole psalm, my soul clings to you. My soul clings to you. Now, my friends, we could go on reading, not just Psalm 63, okay? Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about verses 9, 10, 11 in a moment, okay? 
um, because the tone suddenly shifts. And if all you're interested in in a love letter is a love letter, 9, 10, and 11 really spoil this love letter for you. Because suddenly you're like, oh, those who seek to destroy my way, what, what kind of love letter is this, right? Don't worry, hang in there, hang in there. We'll get to that later. But really, I'm showing you this because today I want you to go home, read the Psalms, and allow the Psalms to grow your vocabulary and to, ex and, and to enlarge your range of expression. For the love of God, right? Because you do. And you want, to, I, I, you want to know something? The more you access new words, the more you access new expressions, the more you're going to find your love, your actual love for God deepening. So there is the words you have to express and the actual love. And you might say, Pastor, no need one. I really love God already, right? But I'm showing you today that Whatever, however much love you already have for God, if you grow your expression, your verbal expression for your love for God, this will also grow in tandem. And it's strange, it's just how language is so woven into what we become. Let me say that one more time. Language is so woven into what we become that as you grow your language, you grow in who you become, right? And now let me show you now, it's not just Psalm 63. I want to show you two more expressions, right? In Psalm 137, right? The psalmist, oh, I want to show you a, 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 a quote. This quote is so good. I read it just last night, right? Um, the quote is, uh, the words we use are a good indication of what we consider important. The frequency and number of words we have for a given thing or experience and its value in our worldview are connected right okay so 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 if, if you you can take a picture of this or maybe it's going to show up in your zoom chat just remember this right now now in psalm 137 you know what the psalmist says about jerusalem he loves jerusalem so much he says if i forget you jerusalem let my right hand forget its skill wow that's like that's one that's one amazing way to say i i love jerusalem so much that i will never forget you i will never forget my homeland I will never forget my kampong. If I were to forget my kampong, I might as well be crippled. I might as well not be able to use, I might as well lose all memory of how to use my hands, right? I might as well be a vegetable if I, if I uh, forget my kampong, right? Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth. In other words, I, I might as well be unable to speak at all if I forget you, O Jerusalem. That's what the psalmist is saying. Almost, he's almost saying that, that there's no point being able to speak. If I can forget these things. Wow, what a way to what if someone wrote you a love letter, if I forget you, I might as well, I might as well, we always just shortcut and say I might as well just die, right? Right? But what what a way to say it. If I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. 139. Is is this is the one we all know, right? Where shall I go to hide from your spirit? You know, where can I go to flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts. Now, again, remember, I said that we are functional Asian people with rational Western thinking. Most of us looking at this psalm, we might immediately say, why, why use so many words to say the same thing? Huh? Very wasting, huh? right? Let's keep to the, the word count small. Let's just say you are everywhere in fact everywhere is just a little bit um, um not succinct enough let's just uh, um uh, uh shorten it even further you are omnipresent full stop count him ready the whole one psalm 139 no need ready because psalm 139 uh, is summarized in a dot point omnipresent god but is that poetic does that express do you go to god in your prayer life and say god omnipresent <laughs> a bit no feel right a bit no feel i don't know like maybe you got feel for you like, because because you love reading dog point reports you know and that that's your love language for me no feel though but when i read psalm 139 and i and i and i see the bible says that your eyes roam uh, uh, across all of the earth wow i really that's omnipresent man your eyes roam across all of the earth right that's something you know my my friends another element Okay, so that's my first, that kind of like my first sub-element is that you have to grow your language. And why? Because you know what? 
These guys, they are not just expressing their affection for God, their fidelity for God in good times. And if you've uh, hung around me and you've, 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 you've done like you've been married, you know, under my care, or, or, or we've done weddings together, you will often hear me say this, that it's very easy to be in love on a wedding day, right? And you also often hear, uh, 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 or you will know, you will know that the, the wedding vows includes the words for better or worse, for richer or poorer, right? In sickness and in health. Now, I want to tell you something as I tell all our married couples, right? You don't need to make a vow to stay together for better. Actually, you don't. In good times, you're going to stay together. When you're loving each other, you're going to stay together. When everyone's healthy, you have a much higher chance of staying together, right? When, 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 you, are, when you have enough on the table, you are likely to stay together. Why do you make those vows? It's not for the positive side of, 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 those, vow, of those vows. You make those vows because you need to stay together during worse, during poorer, during sickness, in the, on the days when your chips are all down, then you need the vow to lash you onto, onto, the, onto, the, onto the covenant of marriage and say, no, you're not going to break up. No, you're not going to be set apart. I, your vow, I've extracted that vow from your mouth. You will honor it. And then you say, God, I promise, I swore before you, I will love them for worse. I will love them through sickness. I will love them through poverty. And I will honor my vow. And that's what Jonah said. The vow that I made before you, I will keep it. Right? And so, my friends, the language of the Psalms expressing love, you look at all these Psalms, they look like, wow, they must be in so lovey-dovey, I really need to know. Right? But, the reality is quite different. All these psalmists, they are expressing these great affectionate words of fidelity in the midst of suffering. Psalm 63, those three last verses that absolutely spoil it for you, they give you the context that actually in the midst of all of this, oh Lord, I lie awake at night, I, I, I think about you in the watches of the night, all that love letter stuff, you know what's happening in the background? Enemies are trying to kill this guy. And so in the midst of, having, of facing imminent death, he's saying, I love you. I love you. And as he, as he faces death, he says, I love you. And you know what? That kind of love is much deeper. You want to know how deep is that love, right? Know the context of it being really, really difficult for King David in that moment. And then in that moment of being hounded, literally has a stalker on his tail for nine years, following him everywhere, trying to kill him. And every day his enemies are, are surrounding him and all he can say in, 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 the way he, in, in the way he expresses his love for God is, oh, I thirst for you. And that love has a, accesses a deeper level, a level you and I don't access when we don't go through pain. And so Psalm 63 has that running in the background. Psalm 137, if I forget Jerusalem, may my right hand forget its skill. The context is exile. The context is that they are being mocked by the Babylonians saying, Sing la, sing la. you all got a lot of good songs, right? Sing me your love songs. How deep is your love? And he says, gosh, I remember Jerusalem. How I long for Jerusalem. How I wish I was still there. And then he says, if I forget Jerusalem, yeah. That's the context of the love. And Psalm 139, the one says that if I go here, you're there, there, you're there, you're everywhere, right? The context is people are opposing God. People are mocking God all around him. Everybody is. You go read the ending of Psalm 139, right? The opening is all the love letter. The ending gives you the real context of what's happening at the same time. There is pain, there is suffering, there is hurt, there is wounds, there is fear, there is all of these negative emotions running as an undercurrent to the love songs of the Bible. And why do we need to know this? Because your fidelity for God will be tested. Your allegiance for God will be tested. And if you don't have a discipline of running to the love songs in the Bible, 
that don't just feed you fluffy love songs, right? Now our pop songs feed us fluffy love songs. Tell me why ain't nothing but a heartache, right? Like you're singing about heartache, but you don't even feel heartache. All you feel is like you want to dance, right? That's the, maybe our love songs really do disciple us into a very fluffy vision of romance. But the Bible disciples us into a really solid, robust, earth-deepening vision of what love is. And that kind of devotion, that kind of language will keep you in your fidelity and allegiance and love and covenant for God, for better or worse you have the words for it. For richer or poorer, you have the words for it. In sickness or in health, you have the words for it. Amen? Amen? So please, go back, access your Psalms. And I want to move on from here. Not just Psalms expressing the love and the affection, but also now moving into the confidence in God that He's going to hold me, He's going to come through for me, right? The Psalms give us language to express our confidence, our faith, and our assurance. And just like what I said, that Psalms about love, growing our vocabulary for expression, makes us love better, makes us love deeper and richer, the same applies for faith. Your faith becomes more anchored. Your faith becomes more solid, more robust. It can take a bigger beating. When we grow our range for saying faith-related things. Let's look. I want to go into one study. One study into a psalm, right? Psalm 46. And on your left of the screen, I will show you the pattern of a typical confidence psalm, right? A confidence psalm typically have this kind of movement and all these ingredients are there. You want to cook a meal, you got to have all the ingredients and then you got to put them in, sometimes in a certain order, sometimes you don't need to put it in a certain order as long as it all goes in, right? And a lot of your confidence psalms have all these following Ram 1, Ram 1, okay? Psalm 46, God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. An expression of God's strength. You see it very commonly. And then verse 2, let's click. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, right? And so it's saying that, is there a reason to be afraid? Yes, because why? The earth is giving way. If the earth gives way, will you be afraid? You have every reason to be afraid if the earth gives way. But you know what? Because of verse 1, I will not be afraid. Oddly enough, verse 1 causes me to not be afraid when verse 2 happens. So the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea. In other words, through chaos and trouble, I will have confidence. Why? Because I have first stated God's strength. And that's how we can pray. That's how the Psalms teach us how to pray. And so in your own moment of trouble, in your own moment of chaos and worries, God, you are good. God, you are strong. You are my firm fortress. You are my foundation. You are my rock. I'm using my own words now. I'm using words that have seeped into my heart and my brains through the Bible. God, you are my rock. You are my firm foundation. You are my wall. You are my, you, you, you are my weight, my load-bearing wall. You are my, you are the pillar of my life, my anchor. And that's why if everybody hates my guts, I will not be afraid. If everybody wants to, to leave my life, I will not waver. Right? You can pray like that. Why? Because when you state God's strength, and then you state the chaos, and how you will not fear in spite of the chaos because of, one, God's strength, you have just taught yourself how to stand firm. It's all here, my friends. It's all here. You just need to go into the Psalms and repeat them, and not just repeat them like in a mindless way, but work them into your heart and work the pattern of the Psalms into your heart. That's why I'm showing you the stuff on the left-hand side. Let's move on. Verse 3. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. And you'll notice that verse 4 and verse 5, the tone suddenly shifts. It's almost like there is a serenity. There is a peace. There is almost like the language just takes on this tone of calmness 
and assurance, right? Where else do we see this, right? Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, right? You're stating God's goodness, right? And then somewhere in that kind of like one third mark, it suddenly shifts, right? And it says that, oh, you lead me to lie beside still waters. There is suddenly this picture. You see it in Psalm, I think 73 as well. Yeah, you will see that suddenly there is this picture of calm, of peace. And then verse 6 is the counterpoint. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. More chaos, more trouble. So, so the psalmist is giving a, 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 a comparison, right? In the midst of peace, calm, serenity, and then outside, there is all these things burning down. The whole world is burning down, he says, essentially. Verse 7, verse 8. Let's look at verse 8. Come, behold the works of the Lord. Witness God's victory. That's the next movement. He makes war cease. How he has brought desolations on earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow, shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. That's not God just being destructive and like being like a two-year-old child, right? He's this God destroying the enemy. And so, you see the movement. Peace, chaos. And what happens? Why is there peace in the midst of chaos? Because, come, See how God deals with chaos. See how God deals with the agents that bring chaos. He breaks their bow. He burns their chariots. He makes the conflict cease. That's how God deals with the chaos. Why then can we have peace and, and, and calm and a river flowing through in the midst of it so that you can feel that you really can lie down beside green pastures and still waters because God shatters the bow of the enemy. You can pray that too. The Psalms teach you that you should pray that too in your moment of, of grief and of, of pain and, and, and trouble. Let's look at the next point. Be still, know that I am God. Famous lines, right? Be still, know that I am God. I will be exalted. Now God speaks. You notice how in the Psalms there is an interplay between God speaking, or rather the psalmist speaking, like, Oh God, machamini, machamini, kenapa machamini, amachamini. And then God speaks back. God says, be still. Know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Close inverted commas. Quote marks ended. The Lord of hosts is with us. Because of the quote marks, now he can say, the Lord is with us. I've heard him speak. He replied me. I cried out and he spoke. I waited and he answered. And then he grows confidence in God. My friends, Psalm 46 is just one psalm, like many. You read Psalm 91, the voice keeps changing. One, he's talking to God. Next thing, God is talking to him. Next thing, he's talking to someone about God, right? The you and the he keeps changing. Why? Because it's very dynamic. The Psalms teach us the, the, the many layers of this language for growing confident in God. Let's move on. This is another one. I know this is going to be like, oh my gosh, I can never read this. This is too much, right? You don't have to read this. I show this to you so that you can see that virtually the same pattern is there in Psalm 27. Okay? It starts with God's strength. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? You hear, hear, me, hear, hear me say this. I can read. It's too small for you to read, right? And then he moves on to confidence through chaos and trouble, right? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh. Wow, to eat up my flesh, man. Wow. <laughs> my adversaries and my foes, it is they who stumble and fall. He learns confidence, right? Language of that. And then suddenly, another expression of peace in the storm. One thing I have asked of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Wow, suddenly the tone shift, right? You saw it before, you're seeing it again, right? Amazing. And it's a very long one, huh? The whole part from verse 4, verse 5, it's a very long section there, right? And then he moves on to, to a more assurance, right? And now, now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around and I will offer in his tent sacrifice and shouts of joy, right? Now he feels more assurance. Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud. The tone shifts again. This is almost like a lament, okay? Sandwiched in the midst of a confident psalm, he starts lamenting. And that's one good reminder, don't bypass. 
Don't bypass your emotions, your negative emotions. Don't bypass and let anybody tell you, yeah, you're Christian, you should have more hope. No, if you're feeling down, just be down. It's okay. God can God can God loves it for you to He would rather you be honest than you to fake it. You can't fake it till you make it, okay? Not not with this kind of expression. And so in this kind of like seven, eight, nine, ten. The Lord allows him to express feelings of doubt and feeling abandoned. He actually says, Hear, Lord, when I cry out loud, be gracious to me. You said, seek my face. I seek your face, Lord, right? Your face, I, 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 I seek your face. Hide not your face from me. He goes into this whole lament thing, right? Asking God, how come you are not keeping your end of the bargain? I kept my end of the bargain. And then he moves out of it, which is a good reminder from two weeks ago that lament helps you to go through your pain and without which you can't even you, you, you're still standing on the other side of the shore pretending to be happy and then and then he moves on to the next thing he he prays to god teach me your ways oh lord lead me teach me lead me active verbs teach me lead me walk with me be with me protect me cover me like like how and, and you should know this right this should remind you of jesus's the lord's prayer right right and that and that what, what, what do you want with the bread? Feed me, right? What do you want with your sins? Forgive me, right? And, and, and what do you want with evil? Protect me. Lead me not into these things, right? And then it ends on a note of confidence in the Lord. I believe I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Famous last words. We, we pray these words all the time. All the time. Except that we... we put our hands into Psalm 27 and we gonchang gonchang and we pull out verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I love this. And then we put it on the wall. And then we go in and we gonchang gonchang and we pull out the last verse, you know, um, the second last verse. I shall look upon the Lord. Uh, uh, I shall look upon the, uh, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And we put that, you know, we have the top, we have the tail. And that's not enough. Because if you have the top and the tail, all you have is the pretty parts. But it's the part that's messy and grimy and dirty that teaches us how to really hold on to God through the most difficult times. And with this, my friends, I've essentially, I'm essentially done for today, right? And so, my friends, whether you are online, whether you are physically here, today, I, want, I hope that you see that the, that the Bible gives us a way to grow in speaking to God. And you don't have to say, Pastor, I'm a very square one. I can't do this. Just read it out. Just read it out. But here's the, here's the real thing, my friends. Sometimes we can be just a little bit disintegrated, not integrated, unintegrated. We're done with the slides, yeah? Uh, we, can, we can turn this off. And on this, I'll close. My friends, you go through hard times outside and because we are taught to have a very... Okay, I don't want to minimize the importance of having a positive mindset. I don't want to minimize the importance of being optimistic and being able to see the bright side of things. I think that, that there are many moments where you need to be able to snap out of it Okay, and to see goodness in the midst of whatever you're going through. But that is, you cannot have only one gear. You cannot have only one, like you open, you open your arsenal and like matrix, you open and you only have one gun. You know, and your, and your gun is what? Positivity. And that's all you have. It won't do. Because there are, there are enemies that positivity cannot take down. It just cannot take it down. And so you need to arm yourself with the entire range. And your Psalms, all 150 of them, will arm you with the entire range. And don't worry, you don't have to memorize them. We played a game before our service started, a, Bible, a, a Psalms quiz. And it was an open book for fun, right? And if you didn't open your Bible, you will think, how will I ever memorize some of these little details and, and, and kind of things? You don't have to. You have your Bible. You are expected to open your Bible. You are expected to look through every single psalm and learn and allow it to shape you in your heart. And so, my friends, 
Today, I hope you are ministered to by the words of God. And I hope that there is something inside you that opens up, just opens up, so that you can say to the Lord in more ways than one, I love you. Oh, Father, my Lord, my God, my rock, my fortress, the love of my life, the master of the whole universe, my savior, my friend, my shepherd, my redeemer. Oh, my redeemer lives. I know my redeemer lives. I know nothing can, I know nothing can keep you in the grave. I know, Lord God, that no, that no nail can keep you on the cross. Oh, Lord, I know. I know that nothing can keep you. Nothing can separate me from my love for your love for, for me and likewise my love for you. Oh, Lord God, neither height nor depth, angels nor demons, the present nor the future, nor any powers, nothing shall separate us, Lord God. Oh, Lord, my God, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. Because your steadfast love is better than life, I will praise you. My soul clings to you. Oh Lord, church, this Lord loves you. Church, if anyone, if you feel that the love of someone in your real life has let you down, and you long for the love that you never received, Today, that God, that majestic, multi-layered God, so rich, so deep, no, not enough words to ever describe, that God, He loves you. He hasets you. He loves you with a ferocious love. And so today, Lord, we close this time deeply rooted and entrenched in how much you like us, in how much you love us, in how much you are for us, and how much you go before us. So Father, we thank you. May the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior and King Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us until we meet again and all of God's people shout aloud, Amen. 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 <laughs>